moment he told me I'm free from my past. Now all that I know is I'm never turning back. No, 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 no. I remember the moment he told me I'm free from my past. Your foe, 
mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me if you believe that sing it out there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up come on there's nothing you wouldn't do there's no wall you won't kick down our God fights for us. much for joining us at Woodlands Church Online. His faithfulness never fails. My name is Ryan, and I am so blessed that I get to spend a few minutes with you to prepare you for what God is going to say to you during this powerful message series, Spark. Pastor Kerry's message is all about the creative writing process and how God wants to write your story. It's been so great to see so many in the chat. I wanna give a special shout out to my brother, Josh. It's his birthday today. Hey, Stephanie, hey, Donald, Donna, Vince, Danny, so many of you, the volunteers, thank you for being here. Thank you for serving. Well, today is a great day and there's so much going on. A couple things I wanna let you know about at Woodlands Church Online. The first thing is this, we have the Woodlands Church app. We've had over 25,000 people download the app and use this powerful resource. It's a free thing for Android and iOS. And what's great about it is it allows you to stay plugged into the, to God's church wherever you are. It has the daily devotionals, it has the notes, it has a sermon archive, really everything you need to stay plugged in. We believe that the Christian faith is meant to be lived not just on Saturday and Sunday, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. It's a consistency that is so important to our faith. And I wanna say great job for being here at church. You are building the faith that you need to stay strong in Christ. Well, the Woodlands Church Family is another powerful group. It's Woodlands Church Family Facebook group. Type in Woodlands Church Family or go to wc.org forward slash group on Facebook. And if you're on Facebook, this is a free resource where we share each other's burdens, we pray for each other, and we also share praise reports. So it's a way for our family to stay plugged in with each other throughout the week. And it's a private group, so it's really secure and it's really just a great place to share. I also wanna encourage you, if you're here with us today, you are ready to take your next step. Your next step might be prayer. If we have pastors in the prayer right now, pastors in chat who would love to pray with you, click on the prayer button. We would love to pray with you if you need prayer today, no matter what you're going through, good or bad. Your next step might be that you need have, you have a question about your faith. You may have a question about what it means to be a Christian, or you may have made a faith commitment and you're ready to take that next step and say, how do I get plugged in? If you are a Christian and you're ready to serve with us, I encourage you to try out serving. Go to wc.org forward slash connect and you can fill out that short form and let us know how we can help you take your next step. Me or one of our pastors will follow up with you. And what's really nice about this is as well, once you fill it out, we're gonna send you a free Starbucks coffee. We'd love to do that, a voucher for that because we value your relationship. We value your connection and you're part of this family. You're part of this growing team. Thank you for being here. Well, let me encourage you with this. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile, Romans 1.16. You see, in the early church, there was a big debate over who the word of God belonged to, over who the promise of heaven and the promise of faith in Christ belonged to. At first, some in the early church thought that it was only meant for the Jews, only meant for those who were close to Jesus to begin with. But then Paul and some other disciples had the revelation that no, this good news is meant for the entire world. It's meant for the Jew and the Gentile alike. And that is what the Church Online Ministry is all about. 
We care deeply for every single person, whether they're here in person with us in Houston or watching on the other side of the globe. We believe that the internet and social media has been used for darkness. It's been used to divide people. It's been used to bring people down into depression, but we know it can be a tool and God wants to bring light into the dark places. And that's what we're doing. So thank you so much for being part of what God is doing at Church Online today. And I wanna encourage you, if you could make a one-time or recurring gift to Woodlands Church, the Woodlands Church online campus would be so, so thankful for that. wc.org forward slash give now. That'll take you directly to PushPay, our secure giving platform. You can give with a credit card, debit card, or a bank draft, and you can have total control over that giving. So you can modify it or cancel it at any time. And you can even change the amounts. And it's a powerful platform. And by giving to Woodlands Church online, you make the ministry happen. It takes resources, it takes money, and it takes time. And our volunteers are giving so much of their life, so much sacrifice is going on. And we appreciate the financial sacrifice that you are making to make Woodlands Church possible, to make this message of hope grow and go throughout the world and go even to the darkest corners where Christ is most needed. Well, we've had over 30,000 people join us at Woodlands Church Online so far in 2022 alone. It's been amazing to see the growth of the Church Online campus. Thank you for being part of that. But what we celebrate even more than that is we've had over 40 people raise their hand in faith in the Church Online platform and say, I wanna make a faith commitment today. I wanna commit my life to Christ. We celebrate each and every one of those faith commitments. And if you're here today and you're ready to take a faith, a next step in your faith, go ahead and raise your hand. We'd love to see that because we believe that God has a plan and a purpose for you. You're not here on accident. You are here for a reason. And then I wanna encourage you before we continue on and before we continue in worship and before Pastor Kerry gets into this powerful message, do one thing for us. Will you build his church? Will you help share the hope of Christ? live.wc.org. You can give You can give and support in that way or you can share and support in that way or do both. It means so much to us. When you share this on YouTube, hit the share button on the video below YouTube and share it via text message or social media. It means so much. On Facebook, when you hit the share button and share it to your profile feed, that makes a difference. When I invite people to church, it's one thing, but when you invite your friends, yes, you who's been coming, I'm talking to you. When you invite your friend and share hope, it means the world and it can make an eternal difference in someone's life. I wanna encourage you to share it. It's so easy to do on social media. It's so, so easy to text a friend. Try it one time. Will you please share this message? Well, let's continue to worship him. God is going to speak to us today. Pastor Kerry's with us and God is moving powerfully in our church family. Thanks for being part of it. Let's continue to worship. Come on. Yes.
fresh wind from the Lord God today? Do you need God to do something new and powerful in your life? Hey, don't depend on what God did for you 10 years ago or even 10 days ago. God wants to do something new and powerful in your life. He wants to spark some amazing changes in your heart this year. He wants to give you some new dreams, some new visions, some new paths that are gonna change everything. Do you believe that, Woodland Church? Let's bow together and thank him, yes. Dear Lord, we thank you in advance for what you're about to do. We ask you, Lord, to just bless and strengthen and give us everything that you want us to receive today. I pray that your word would open our eyes to really see your love for us and that we would experience a miracle, Lord, as we learn to trust you, to depend upon you, and to surrender our whole lives to you. And Lord, I know that you're writing the story of our lives and you're writing something good. You're writing something that will last forever. So I pray, Lord, for everyone who feels like they're in a forgotten chapter. Everyone, Lord, worshiping with us through our online family, everyone here in the Woodlands, everyone in our Tascacita campus, Lord, that you would just let them know that you've not forgotten them. You're just not finished with the story yet. And good things are on the way. And we thank you, Lord, that the best is you. That it's not the presence you give us, it's your presence, Lord, that's here right now. And it's with everyone, wherever they are, who loves you, Jesus, you're right there. You're right there with us. You live inside us through your Holy Spirit, and you make all the difference. Lord, I thank you that the same power that raised you from the dead lives inside of all of those who believe you, and that you have the power to resurrect our story. You have the power to change our lives. Do that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can be seated. Hey, God is a master storyteller. The creator of the universe is the creative writer who created you and he loves stories. And he created you to love stories. Ellie Wazell said, God made human beings because he loves stories. And it's so true. God loves the story of you. You are his creation. Now I'm not talking about the fiction story of you that you'd like God and others to believe. I'm talking about the nonfiction story of your life that's real and raw. It's not some fairy tale where everything always works out perfectly. Your story is filled with wonderful chapters and painful chapters. It's filled with love and loss. It's filled with great successes and epic failures. It's a nonfiction story, but it doesn't have to be a non-fulfilling story. If you give the creative writer who created you, the pen of your life. He will redeem your pain and rewrite your story. Our key verse today is just one small verse in 2 Samuel chapter 22. Would you stand in honor of God's word? Why don't you just read this out loud with me? We'll see how awake you really are. Read this out loud with me. God rewrote the text of my life when I opened the book of my heart to his eyes. Apparently you're not very awake because you didn't read that very good, so. <laughs> Let's try it again. I want you to get this. God rewrote the text of my life when I opened the book of my heart to his eyes. Did you get that? God, the creative writer who created the universe and created you, when you give him the pen of your life and you open up the book of your heart to him, he rewrites the story of your life and makes it a story that is so powerful that it will last forever. You can be seated. When you give God the pen, he writes the story of your life into a story of redemption and purpose and meaning. He also puts his spark of creative writing in your heart, and it helps you see the beauty in all the broken pages of your past. You see that every chapter has been changed by his grace, and every paragraph now has a purpose. That's what he did for Saul. You remember Saul? Saul was writing his own autobiography, and it looked like a perfect story. But like a lot of autobiographies, everything written in it was designed to make the author look good. The problem was it was all fiction. Now, the people around Saul 
had believed the lies. Even Saul himself had bought into the false narrative that his life was a perfect life until one day he was hit with writer's block as all of his story came to a sudden stop on the road to Damascus. In Acts chapter nine, it says, as he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. See, Saul was on a mission to stop this small group of people called Christians from writing another chapter in what he felt was a subversive story that had to be stopped. He wanted to block Christianity from spreading, but instead Christ blocked him from writing another destructive word in the story. Saul was blinded on that road to Damascus, but the truth is he had been blind to the truth his whole life. He was blinded for his whole life. He wasn't seeing clearly what his story was really all about. He hit writer's block that day, but the truth is he had had writer's block his whole life because he was trying to write his own story and every word was meaningless. Saul had writer's block because he was comparing himself with others. And as long as I'm comparing myself with others, my story will make no sense. My story will have no meaning. Now, after his conversion, his name was changed from Saul to Paul. And instead of trying to write his own story, God gave him a spark of divine writing, and he wrote most of the New Testament. God wrote most of the New Testament through Paul. Paul stopped trying to write his own story, and God inspired him to write his story. And that's what history is all about, God's story. In Philippians 3.6, Paul would later say, he wrote most of the New Testament, he wrote the book of Philippians, mostly from a prison cell. And in Philippians 3, 6, he talked about his past life and he said, and sincere, yes, so much so that I greatly persecuted the church and I tried to obey every Jewish rule and regulation right down to the very last point. But all those things that I once thought very worthwhile, now I've thrown them all away so that I can put my trust and hope in Christ alone. Paul was saying, I was writing a very religious story because when it came to religion, I was at the top of my class. I followed all the rules and all the regulations. I did it what I thought was perfectly following religion, but it was just death. It was just meaningless words on a page. It was empty, but I did it better than anyone else. Paul said, I was comparing myself to everyone else and I felt really good about myself because there was no one that could compare with me. But I didn't realize I should have compared myself to the only one that matters, perfect, holy God, the creative writer of the universe who created me. He said, I should have compared myself to him and I would have realized how I could never measure up. I had everything backwards so much so that I persecuted the people that had it right. They weren't writing a religious story, they were writing a relationship story, a love story, with their relationship with God, the creative writer through his son, Jesus Christ. And see, whenever you compare yourselves to others, it's always destructive because it makes you the main character of the story. It takes your focus off God and onto you. Whenever I compare myself to someone else, I make myself the main character of the story. And it's so destructive because when you compare yourself to others, you either get proud because you think that your story is better or you're better or smarter or more talented or better looking or more successful than they are and you get proud. Or you get depressed because you compare yourself and you think uh, they're better, smarter, more talented, more beautiful are more successful than you are. 
And either way, you make yourself the focus. You become the main character of your story. And whenever you make yourself the main character of your story, it will be a misguided story that is meaningless. Paul had made himself the main character of his story. He was comparing himself to everyone else. And that's what a religious story is all about. It's all about trying to be better than someone else. And it's about measuring yourself against everyone else. And so he would later say in 2 Corinthians 10, 12, another book in the New Testament that he wrote, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. It's not wise to compare yourself with anyone else because it makes you the main character of the story, the main focus, instead of God. And by the way, whenever you compare yourself to someone else, it's pretty ridiculous because there's no one else in the world like you. When God made you, he broke the mold. Did you realize there's no one else who's ever lived of all the billions of people that have walked this planet in all of human history that has your fingerprints? Did you realize there's no one else who's walked this earth of all the billions in human history that have your voice print, that your footprint? You're uniquely made by the creative writer who created the universe and created you uniquely. There's no one else like you. So when you compare yourself to someone else, there's no comparison. There's no one else like you. When you compare yourself to someone else, many times, try to be like them rather than be who God created you to be. Paul said, I'm so glad that I stopped being the main character of my story. I am so glad that I stopped trying to write a religious story and I placed all my faith and my hope in Jesus Christ alone instead of in myself. I'm no longer the main character of my story, Paul said. It's Jesus Christ. I'm no longer the author. He's the author and finisher of my faith. After the road to Damascus, Saul gives the pen to God. God changes his name and his role in the story, and Paul lets him rewrite the story of his life. And then God sparks this true writing that comes through Paul, this divinely inspired writing that comes through Paul, and he writes most of the New Testament. And until you stop trying to be the author and the main character in your story, your story will never make sense to you, and it will never have any power to make a difference in someone else's life. I have to say that as a Christ follower, there are times, though, when I try to take the pen back from God and I try to write God a minor role in my story, do you ever do that? I mean, when you receive Christ, you give him the pen of your life, you open the book of your heart to him, you let him write the story. He writes all these amazing chapters, but there's so many times when I'll try to take the pen back from him and I'll try to write something in for him and I'll write him into a minor role and expect him to be happy about it. It's like, God, I've got this great idea. I think it's from you, so if you'll give me the pen, I think I can write it better than you do, but I'm gonna write you in a role, I promise. You're gonna have a role in this because if this dream comes true, then you're gonna be really blessed, God. It's all for you, God. And we write ourselves in again as the main character, and we give God a little minor role and expect God to be happy. God doesn't accept a minor role. He's either the main character or nothing at all. And you see, Whenever I take the pen back from God and I try to make myself the main character because I think I know what's best rather than God, then I again feel the pressure of trying to be the creative writer of the universe, trying to control everything, trying to make everything work out the way I want it to, and I'll get writer's block because God will block me in my path because he loves me too much. He'll do just about anything even blind you on the road to Damascus when you're going the wrong direction because he loves you that much. Well, as Christ followers, though, we do that, don't we? We try to take the pen back, think we know what's best. But after Jesus stops Saul in his tracks and he's blinded and he needs the people around him to help him, to guide him into Damascus, he's totally powerless and he realizes that he, he can't do it. He finally realizes that he doesn't have the power to write his own story. And he goes to Ananias' house, who was a believer. God leads him there. 
Ananias lays his hands on Paul's eyes and it says it was like scales that fell from his eyes for he saw again and he saw the truth for the first time. He saw that he wasn't God and that he could never measure up to perfect holy God and he needed Jesus Christ and he came to Christ, he was saved, he was baptized and Christ erased all of his sins and began to rewrite his story. But I think it's important to know that Christ didn't edit out all of Paul's failures from his past. He didn't edit out all the pain from Paul's past. No, he just wrote some new chapters that changed the meaning of every word from his past. And God doesn't edit out all the pain and all the failures from your past. He'll erase and forgive you of all your guilt. He'll erase and forgive you of all your sins, but You can't go back and change what you did back there in the past. But here's what's so powerful. God won't edit out all that you did in your past. He'll just write some new chapters that change everything and give meaning to all you did and brings even more glory to him. You see, a lot of times we try to edit out our failures from the past. We try to edit out our pain We try to ignore the pain or the trauma and edit it out of our lives as if it didn't happen. But it will always come back in the present. And it will dominate every chapter of your life in the present. And so you don't edit out the pain from the past. You don't edit out your failures from the past. You don't edit out your struggles or your struggles in the present. What do you do? You give them to God. You give him the pen of your life. And he writes something new that turns every sentence in your past into salvation, that turns every paragraph into purpose. That's what he does. He takes every page, broken page from the past, and he writes something new that makes the brokenness beautiful, and he puts it all together. See, Paul didn't deny the reality of his past failures. He didn't minimize them because that would have minimized God's power and grace in his life. In 1 Timothy 1.15, he says this. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Paul said, I'm not gonna try to edit out all my failures and sins and mistakes He said, I was the worst of sinners. I murdered people. I killed Christians, those who were doing it right. I thought I was right. And I did some awful things. I'm not gonna minimize that. I'm not gonna deny that. I'm not gonna say that wasn't that bad. No, because if I did that, it would minimize God's grace and blessing and forgiveness and salvation in my life. No. I'm just gonna let him write something new. Something new, a new chapter in my life that takes all of the brokenness and the failures and turns it into a story of faith that brings him fame. That's what I'm gonna do. And a lot of times I wanna edit out the pain from my story. I wanna edit out the failures from my past. I wanna minimize the seriousness of my sins. But when I do that, I minimize the blessing that God wants to bring in my life. You see, he erases the guilt of our sins. He forgives completely. But yet, I can't go back and change what I've done, but I can let him write something that gives purpose to every paragraph. You see, Every great story always involves failure and pain and conflict and heartache and loss. If it didn't have those things in the middle of the story, it wouldn't be a great story. Every great story contains pain and failures and problems and that's always a part of every great story. So you can't edit the pain or trauma 
out of your past, but you can give the pen to God and let him write purpose from the pain. You can't edit out the failures of your past, but you can give the pen to God and let him write a story of faith from your failures. You can't edit out the struggles from your past or present, but you can give the pen to God and let him write his strength from your struggles. You see, a lot of times we try to edit out the bad. Don't try to edit out the bad from your story. You give the pen to God and he will write something good. He will write something good out of all the bad and the hurt. He will take all of it and bring about his purpose and bring about his good in your story. When you try to edit out the failures from your past, you edit out his grace and his blessings in your future. Well, how do you practically make Christ the main character of your story? How do you practically let Christ be the author and finisher of your faith? Well, he gives us a great example here with Ananias. Ananias was a believer who really had given God the pen of his life, and, and God was the main character of his story. And we see what happens in Acts 9.10, it says, there was a disciple in Damascus by the name of Ananias. The master spoke to him in a vision, and Ananias, yes, master, he answered. I love those two words, yes, master. You see, God spoke to Ananias and said, Ananias? And Ananias' first word was yes, the second word was master. I love that, he was saying yes to whatever you're gonna say next because you are my master, because you are the main character of the story, you're the master storyteller. You are the creative writer who created me and, and loves me and I trust you to write my story. I trust you to write something good and powerful and beautiful out of it. And he said yes first, that was the first thing he said, yes. That's really important. Can you say yes? Why don't we say yes really loud? Yes! Yes! yes. 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 It's kind of coming from all different areas of this great auditorium. It, it, let's try to do it in unison. I'll say yes first and then you say yes. Let's do that, okay? You guys are brilliant. You can do it. Yes! 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 yes. 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 Dear Lord, you have heard our answer. Now tell us what you want us to do. Some of you are going, can I take back that yes? Let that be a maybe. Record that as a maybe. Think about it for a moment. You know, I pray, God, show me your will. You know, just show me what to do next. What, and a lot of times what I really mean is, God, show me your will so I can decide if I want to do it or not. Sometimes people come up to me and they say, I don't know God's will, I'm really struggling, I'm really confused. How do you know God's will for your life? How do you know what God wants you to do in a certain situation? How do you know? And a lot of times, it's because God has let them get in this place where they feel that confusion so they'll learn to depend on him more, to listen more clearly, to really tune into God. But there are other times when they're asking God, show me your will so I can look at it to see if I want to do it. And God won't do that. You've got to say yes first, and then he shows you what he wants you to do. You've got to say yes first, and he will show you his will. Sometimes it's a struggle that he allows you to go through that struggle to get to know him better, to trust him, that waiting time. But, but so many times, if you just say yes, God, I trust you, I know that you love me, I know you know what's best for me, he's going to tell you. He's gonna make it clear to you. He's not trying to hide his will from your life. And so when I say yes, God reveals his will. Here's the point. Until you say yes, God's not gonna tell you the next step. And I said yes. If Chris and I would have waited for God to show us all of his plan for Woodland Church before we started Woodland Church, we would have never started the church. We said yes as God put a call in our heart and we would take a little step in faith, and God would open a door. And then we would say yes, and take another step in faith, and God would open a door. We would say yes, take another step in faith. A lot of people wanna solve all the problems before they ever take a step of faith, and that's impossible. If you're waiting for all the problems to be worked out, 
then you will never start anything. It's like the NASA moon missions. JFK said, we're gonna land a man on the moon by the end of the decade. When he made that statement, none of the technologies had been invented yet to get that done. Uh, but he took that step of faith, and then they started solving the problems. That's the way it is for any dream, for any vision, for any goal. You can't solve it all before you start. You gotta take a step of faith. And then God begins to solve the problems and open the doors, and that's just the way it works. And I love how Ananias said, yes, master, you're the master storyteller, yes. Whatever you wanna write, you write, I'm here. I I've opened the book of my heart to you and you're writing the story of my life. But I love how Ananias is so real because after he says yes, then God says, oh great, because I'm sending Saul of Tarsus to your house. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's coming to your house, and I need you to lead him to me and to baptize him because I've chosen him. And here's what Ananias says next. Ananias protested, master, you can't be serious. Everybody's talking about this man and the terrible things he's been doing his reign of terror against your people in Jerusalem, and now he's shown up here with papers from the chief priest that give him license to do the same to us. But the master said, don't argue, go, I have picked him as my personal representative to Gentiles and kings and Jews. Isn't that interesting? Ananias says, yes, and God says, great. Here's what I want you to do. Receive Saul of Tarsus into your home. And Ananias says, this doesn't make any sense, God, don't you know? I mean, he's a killer. I mean, we've been talking about him for the last several days with the other believers in the church, and, and we know that he's killed some of the believers in Jerusalem. He stoned Stephen. He was there holding the coats while, while they killed him. And he, he's gotten permission from the high priest to come here now, and he's gonna do the same thing. God, you're just giving me a death sentence. Don't you know that? And I love how he just expressed what he really felt. That's just being honest with God, not denying those true feelings and those doubts and that confusion, but then he did it. Why? Because he didn't take the pen back. And when you take the pen back from the master storyteller, when it doesn't make sense, when you see a sentence that he's writing that you don't totally understand and you take the pen back, you miss out on the blessings. You see, if we only obey God when we understand everything, God, I, that sounds great, but I need to understand every single thing about this, and then maybe I'll do it, you're gonna miss out on the blessings, because he is the master storyteller, and you don't understand it all, and we won't understand all of it until we get to the last page, until we turn the page into eternity. And that's when the real story starts, but we have to understand that he knows what's best. And I love the fact that Ananias obeyed. He didn't try to take the pen back from God. He obeyed, he knew, hey God, he knows what he's doing. He's always taking care of me, he loves me. I don't get this one, but I'm gonna do it even if it means death. But God knew exactly what he was doing. See, it all comes down to one thing, understanding that your story is a love story. You are not the main character of your story, but the main character is crazy in love with you. That's what you need to understand because if you understand a little bit of how much God loves you, then you can surrender and trust him with the pen of your life. You can trust him as the main character of your story even when your story doesn't make any sense to you at the time because God knows what he's doing and he loves you so much that he wants the best for you. If you take the pen back from God, you'll never get God's best. And that's why Paul was able to say in Romans 5.8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Paul said, I was going a totally wrong direction. You know, I was a murderer. I was so prideful. And I was destroying lives and families and thinking I was doing the great thing for God. I was writing my own story. But God stopped me in my tracks and he blinded me to show me how blinded I'd been my whole life. Why did he do that? Because he loved me that much. He loved me that much when I was still a sinner, breaking his heart and killing his people. He loved me that much? I don't understand that kind of love, but I accept it. And I trust him with my whole life that he will write the story of my life. 
I love in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8, Paul says love never fails. You see, Paul began to understand and grasp God's love in such a powerful way that he wrote 1 Corinthians 13. It's called the love chapter. It's read at so many weddings, but it's all about what real love is. Real love in action. It's not a feeling. It's an action. It's a commitment. What real love is. And he began to understand God's love and God sparked that creative writing in him, and he writes out what love really is in 1 Corinthians 13, divinely inspired. And in verse 8, he says, love never fails. See, your story is a love story. And when you give the pen to God, he takes all of your failures, and it's no longer a story of failure, it's a story of success, because love never fails. That's why this church will never fail. It's built on love, loving Jesus, not religion. It's built on loving Jesus Christ and loving each other and loving people that are far from God. It's built on love. It's built on the truth with love. And without that love, no, nobody would change. Nobody would come to Christ without Christ's love. It's all Christ's love on the cross that changes everything. And he tells us the truth. Why? Because he loves us enough to tell us the truth. He stopped Paul in his tracks and said, you're going the wrong direction, man. This is gonna be painful. But the pain is because I love you. And some of you are going through some pain right now. You've hit a wall and you can't get past that wall. Could it be that that wall is God's love? Do you feel like, man, I'm just hitting my head against a wall. This is painful. And God says, this is love. I'm protecting you from what's behind the wall. You think you're going to success. You think you're going to make it. You think you're going the right direction, but you're gonna end up empty if you keep going this way. So I'll do just about anything to stop you in your tracks to try to wake you up so you'll give me the pen and let me write the story because I know what will bring you fulfillment because I created you. You see, some of you have gone through a rejection. Maybe you were rejected for a job promotion. Maybe you were turned down for a new job and you just gone through rejection or maybe your boyfriend just broke up with you or Girlfriend broke up with you. You've gone through some rejection, and it's painful. But I want you to know, if you're a Christ follower, rejection is protection. God is protecting you. Rejection is God's protection. He's protecting you. And he is saving you for his best. That's what he's doing. Oh, it's painful, and it's okay to grieve. It's okay to hurt. It's okay to feel that it's unfair, but... You have a God who loves you so much that he'll do anything to protect you and to guide you to his best. Love never fails. Now, Paul's story after he came to Christ wasn't a perfect story. It was far from perfect. In fact, it was very painful at times. Paul was beaten. He was stoned. He was thrown in prison many times. He had great things that happened in his life, and he had terrible things that happened in his life. And once you give the pen to God, it doesn't mean there'll be no more pain, there'll be no more difficulties, no. I used to think that life was like a roller coaster, that sometimes I was on a, a high, and then other times I would be in the valley on a real low, and either I was going up, or I was on a high, or I was going down, or I was in a low. And, and you know, when people ask you, how you doing? and you're hurting on the inside, but you say, I'm doing great. You're not really lying because part of your life is doing great because life's not like a roller coaster. It's like two tracks. Uh, you know, some things in my life are going amazing, and then other things are really painful and really tough and difficult at the same time. Does that describe your life? Yes. For you see, that's the way it was with Paul after he gave the pen to God. There were some painful tracks that were going on, very painful, and then there were some powerful tracks that were so amazing. Some of the highest highs and lowest lows were going on at the same time. For you see, there were many times Paul was put in prison, and it looked like his story would never be told. It looked like that his story would be forgotten and thrown into the garbage can of history. And maybe today you feel like all the pain and struggle in your story is meaningless, that God has forgotten you, that God has just stopped writing your story, or God is nowhere around. And I just want you to know, if you feel forgotten today, God has not forgotten you. He's just not finished with the story yet. He's still writing. Maybe it doesn't make sense right now in the middle of the book, 
but God is still writing. If you had a bestseller and you were reading it and you got to page 150 halfway through the book and you turned to page 151 and it was blank and all the rest of the pages were blank because there was a printing error on your copy, that story wouldn't make sense, would it? It wouldn't make sense at all. And some of you are right in the middle of your story and you're about to take the pen back from God because you feel like God's forgotten you. You feel like it's up to you to write the story. God has not forgotten you. He's just not finished with the story yet. And your story is not finished and your story is not over until God says it is. You see, your story's not over until God writes the last word because God gets the last word. God will write the last page. Only God can close the book. And maybe somebody has told you your story is over. Maybe growing up, someone said, you'll never amount to anything. Maybe you feel like your story is over. It's not over until God says it's over. He will have the last word. Maybe a doctor has said, your story is over. You, you get your affairs in order, the book's about to close, and, and maybe it doesn't look good, but until God says it's over, it's not over. God has the last word. God's not finished with you yet. He's not finished with your story yet. Your story's not over. God is still writing as long as you're still breathing, and he's writing something beautiful out of the brokenness. So hold on, wait for the Lord and you'll renew your strength. Wait for the Lord because he's coming and he's coming through. And even when the last word is written and the book of your life is closed, if he's been the main character, the author and finisher of your faith, then a new book opens, the real book, the real story of you for all eternity. Page one, for all eternity, a book that never ends. Well, Paul had many times where he felt like that he was forgotten. And maybe you feel like you're in a forgotten chapter right now. That's okay. It's not the end of the story. He's just not finished yet. There was a time when the people of Israel felt like God had forgotten them. And in Isaiah 49, 14, they said, the Lord has deserted us. The Lord has forgotten us. And God answers them right away, never. Can a mother forget her nursing child? Can she feel no love for the child she has born? but even if that were possible, I would not forget you. See, I've written your name on the palms of my hands. God said, I will never forget you. You're just in a forgotten chapter right now, but I'm gonna write something new that's gonna give meaning to every sentence in that forgotten chapter, and it's gonna turn into a faith chapter. You're just in the waiting room of life, and I'm building your faith, and as I write this new chapter, you're gonna look back and say, praise God for that chapter, because that's where God worked in my life the most. I didn't know it at the time. Praise God for that chapter because now I see it more clearly. God says, I can never forget you because I'm writing and every time I'm writing a sentence, I, I look at my hand and I see your name and I smile. He said, how can a mother forget her little baby? But he said, even if that were possible, I'm not gonna forget you. I'm just not finished with you yet. I'm gonna keep writing because I have some amazing things to write in your story. Your story's not finished yet and your story will last forever because it's an eternal story. And so God is still writing. I love that because it reminds me of like in grade school when a, a little boy or a little girl will write down their crush on their hand, you know, and keep looking at it and thinking about them and smiling. And that's the way God is with you. You're not the main character of your story, but the main character is crazy in love with you. He thinks about you all the time. He'll never forget you. You can feel forgotten, you're just in a forgotten chapter. And he's gonna write something that's gonna turn that into a faith chapter. Because your future is as bright as the promises of God. You hold on to that, don't give up, you wait on the Lord. Don't give up right before the blessing. The blessing is right around the bend. God's best is right around the bend. Don't give up just before the miracle. God can take the mess and write a miracle from it. I love how that even though Paul had painful chapters and silent chapters. His story was an eternal story that would last forever. For you see, God gave him a vision that he would go to Rome. And I'm sure at the very first of that, he imagined himself, because he was a, a preacher, a great preacher, he imagined himself preaching in the Colosseum in Rome. And that seemed like 
the most powerful thing, the most effective thing that he could do for God. He would preach the word of God. And have you ever been to the Colosseum? I mean, even the ruins are magnificent. Can you imagine thousands of thousands of people? And there's Paul, this great preacher, preaching the good news and giving his story of how God saved him. He's preaching in the Colosseum of Rome. But that wasn't God's plan. God told him he would go to Rome, but he went to Rome as a prisoner and he was placed in prison for two years before God brought him home. In that prison, I wonder if Paul thought that his story would be forgotten, if his story would never be told, if his story would not make any difference. Wondering if his story was meaningless, but no. It was there in that prison that God sparked his divine writing, his inspired writing through Paul, and Paul wrote most of the New Testament from prison. And that's why we're talking about Paul today, and that's why those words that he wrote, divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit, will change your life today and my life today. Those words are still living, those words are still eternal. Why? Because God was writing the story, and he didn't take the pen back. He let God write the story through him. And Jesus was the main character of the story. And Jesus wrote those chapters that changed all of the pain and the failures into purpose and faith. And that's what he wants to do for us. And in 2 Timothy 4, 7, right before God closed the book, on Paul's earthly life and opened up the book for eternity that was his true story. The last paragraph, Paul says this to young Timothy, who he had mentored for years. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there's in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. He said, you know, I've come to the last sentence on the last paragraph on the last page of the story of my life and the book is about to close on me but that's okay because there's one opening where I get the crown of righteousness that I didn't deserve or earn but I get the crown of righteousness I get to be in heaven forever in that perfect place where there's no more tears no more sorrow no more pain to be with Jesus forever in that place of perfect fulfillment and the amazing thing was we can't really see to the other side. We can't even imagine exactly what it would be like. It's just we know from God's word that it's more real than we could ever imagine. It's more beautiful, more powerful, more fulfilling we could ever imagine, all those things. But human words, you know, are we use to describe something that's humanly impossible to describe, this perfect place called heaven. But, but Paul, because he'd walked so closely with God, and let God write every word of the story and Christ be the main character, when he came to the last paragraph, he could see a cross and he could see the crown of righteousness that was coming. I love that because we're looking at it from the wrong side and many times we can't see it. Corey Tinboom, whose family was in World War II, arrested by the Nazis, placed in a concentration camp because her devoutly Christ-following family was hiding Jews and others that the Nazis were trying to exterminate, and so they built a hiding place in their house. And they had, you know, sometimes 20, 30 packed in there and people trying to save their lives from the Nazi regime and in Amsterdam that was occupying the Netherlands. And they found out that they were doing this and the authorities arrested the whole Tin Boom family, but they didn't find the hiding place. And their Jewish friends were saved and they brought the Tin Boom family to a concentration camp and everyone in her immediate family died, except for Corey. Even her best friend, her sister, Betsy died in that awful place, but Betsy kept telling her, Corey, when we get out, we're gonna share that God's light can even be in the most dark places, that God's light shines in the darkest places, the most evil places, and Corey said, this makes no sense though. Betsy, it doesn't make any sense that why would God allow this evil? And her sister would keep telling her, it'll all make sense one day. The story will all come together, but you gotta tell the story. And that's what Corey Ten Boom did when she got out. 
for the rest of her life, even into her 70s, she would tell the story of how God brought light in the darkest of places and brought his forgiveness and brought his grace and his power. And she would say that even though she would pray for God to do it differently and and God didn't answer, she didn't understand it and everything looked ugly from this side, but there's another side that God knows all about. And she had this embroidery that was in her house and whenever she would go speak, Anywhere she went all over the world, she would take this embroidery with her and she would hold it up and say, look at this. And she would hold it up from the wrong side and it was this picture here. And it was all the frayed knots and everything and people would think that she didn't realize she had just showed them the back side of it because maybe she's getting a little old and senile and doesn't know and she would go, just look at this. And people would go, I think she doesn't know what she's doing here. And she would say, when you pray and God doesn't answer the way you want, when you go through a time where you feel forgotten, when something doesn't make sense, think about all these frayed knots and how ugly this is. She said, you're just looking at it from the wrong side. And she would turn it around and show them this picture, which was the crown that had been embroidered in the fabric. And she said, you just can't see the crown that's coming because God is sewing together and weaving together a story and it's all about the crown of righteousness. And your story will never be forgotten. You're just looking at it from the wrong side. I want to tell you today, you're looking at it from the wrong side. And as I look at it from the wrong side, I see so many things that are frayed knots and are ugly, don't make sense. I don't understand what God is up to, but I know this. I'm looking at it from the wrong side. And one day when the last sentence is written and the book is closed, another one will open and it will all make sense. It will all come together because will experience his love and presence in complete fullness, in complete light, and all the darkness will be dispelled. I want you to stand with me. I know some of you right now feel like that you're in the forgotten chapter, and, and it's okay in the forgotten chapter to say, God, I feel like you're for, you forgot me. God, it feels like you're silent. I don't understand it. It's okay to be like Ananias. You can't be serious, God to be honest with him. But don't you dare let those doubts keep you from taking a step of faith. You wait on God because he will keep writing the story. He's not finished yet. Don't you dare take the pen back from Almighty God and let the blessings be stolen away from you. Don't you dare take the pen back from Almighty God and start trying to write your own story again because he's got blessings around the bend. You wait on the Lord and he will renew your strength. You wait on the Lord because he will come through. He will never let you down. He will never leave you or forsake you. You are not forgotten. He's just not finished with the story yet. Amen? Do you believe that? Let's just thank him and let's pray together. Dear Lord, I come to you and I ask you to just really speak every heart that has never given you the pen of their life and opened up the book of their heart to you, that they would say this prayer just silently to you right now. Dear Jesus Christ, I admit I've been the main character of my story. I've tried to write my own story. I've tried to be the author and the main character. and It's been all about me and I give up and I surrender to you, Jesus Christ. I ask you, Almighty God, to take the pen and rewrite the story of my life. I ask you, Jesus Christ, to come into my heart, to change me from the inside out. I accept your free gift of forgiveness and salvation in heaven one day that I could never earn. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me so much. Help me grow in my faith. And Lord, I pray for every one of us here today and everyone within the sound of my voice who feels like they're in a forgotten chapter or a confusing chapter or a senseless chapter, just remind all of us, Lord, that you're just not finished yet. And you're writing something beautiful out of the brokenness. I pray for those, Lord, who are trying to edit out their failures or the pain because, Lord, it's so painful. And Lord, I pray that we would just take all of our failures and sins and struggles to you, all the pain to you at the cross so you can write purpose out of the pain and you can write your strength out of our struggles and you can write something purposeful out of our pain is only you can. 
Lord, we thank you that you love us so much. We ask you to give us your strength to wait. If that's what we need to do, to wait for you to keep writing the story, to not try to take the pen back, but to let you write all that you want because you're not finished with the story yet. I pray for those who feel like they're finished, that they would realize you're not finished with them and that you would do mighty things as we wait on you. In Jesus' name, amen.